Welcome back. We're talking about the recent Tunisia elections. Where do the Arab Spring countries stand four years after the revolution? Still with us is Saha Khamis, a professor of communications at the University of Maryland. Hamid Abdel Jabbar is with Rutger University Center for Middle Eastern Studies from New York. He joins us. And Najib Ayachi is the founder and president of the Maghreb Center. Uh, Najib, we were talking about the elections in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. Here we have two parties of pretty widely differing ideologies, but they're working together. They accept each other. Mm -hmm. Yes, as I mentioned, uh, the, some of the reasons were that the Islamist leadership was in contact with the with with the with the way they we, we do politics in the West because they spent a lot of time as, uh, so they get acquainted with the need of compromise. Uh, I think that's important. The second point I wanted to make early on was that the left, the seculars, the left and the Islamists, both of them were suppressed, as we know, by the Ben Ali regime, the, the autocracy, worked together to fight the autocracy. So that, and they forged bonds uh, in that manner. That is helpful now. The third, maybe, point we tend not to, uh, we to neglect, but I think uh, we, we are talking about foreign interferences. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get back to, to that. Uh, there, there, there was a lot of uh, European including French, France having this influence in Tunisia, and on the part of the United States, for them to work together. For the Islamists to ease it up, if I may say, and, 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 and compromise. And, and, and uh, so they, there were pressure, outside pressure, for them to, because the United States, Western Europe, but mostly the United States, needed Tunisia as a showcase, you know, an Arab Spring that can implement democracy, a country that can implement democracy and, and have and above all have the Islamists integrating the democratic or the um, scene and playing by the democratic rules so that's very important for the United States right. and I think Tunisia is for them the case uh, the issue perfect okay okay let's go to Hamid and Hamid when we look at the example of Tunisia and we see that you know we have a more secular party which uh, basically gets on uh, in the political spectrum uh, with a party an Islamic party uh, I mean, that's not just in Tunisia. We see that in other countries as well. We see that in Malaysia. We see that in Indonesia. We see that in Turkey uh, as well, don't we? Yes. Yeah, we do. I, I just want to uh, just make a, a brief comment on the case of Tunisia because I've been following the case of Tunisia. I visited the country twice after the revolution. And I want to just add one important fact that there is a civil society in Tunisia, a mature civil society, mm -hmm. especially the, gra uh, the General Union of the uh, Tunisian Workers, which was established in 1930s, a very solid rock for the uh, civility that we can see in Tunisia. Tunisia is a peaceful country. They don't know, uh, they don't know assassination. They don't know violence, it's except recently. So the two assassinations that took place in Tunisia in the, in the last, uh, after the revolution, it shocked the whole nation, and it turned them against the Islamists. They want Al-Nahda to stay in power, but not as a drive in the driver's seat. That's why they de-seated it from the driver's seat and put it back into the passenger seat, because it's a, it's a uh, political uh, uh, force it exists there a lot of supporters but they don't want extremists they they were all the country were united against those extremists and Salafis now looking into the bigger picture there are, in every Arab country every Muslim country there are many political parties that advocate Islam however there are also secular and the way out of this quagmire is to find common ground between the groups I mean free and fair elections will bring those uh, to power should every every uh, political force every political should accept the results until the you know the end of the term if they do achievement they will uh, be re-elected again the way the, uh, the justice and development party was elected in 2002 2006 and 2011 in turkey again the same thing the justice and development party in morocco now is is is, is the uh, ruling the country with with so much consent among the other secular and non-secular groups so this is the model okay. tunisia gave a model it, it started the revolution and the model tunisia gave to all the arab and muslim countries
country, I think it will prevail, and people okay. will look up to that model and to try to copy it and learn from it. All right, so. I think that's very important, the idea of building alliances and being able to work across the board, you know, across all the different ideological, religious, and political differences is very, very important. Right. I think the reason why we are seeing a lot of setbacks and a lot of chattered hopes and obstacles now is because there was some somehow of an endangered or, uh, you know, striffled uh, civil society in many of the Arab countries that witnessed the Arab Spring movement. You know, the civil society was not able to really be nurtured and to grow and to have some kind of, you know, right. uh, ability to work across the board and to form strong civil society organizations or NGOs or strong opposition movements. If this had been the case, we would not have seen some of the severe setbacks that we are seeing now and going back again to military rule and so on. And that's because people were not able to bridge their differences and to work across the divide and to build successful alliances. In fact, one of the criticisms against the Muslim Brotherhood was they, you know, they craved power and you know, jumped on the opportunity being one of the most organized movements despite all the repression and all the... But they uh, were elected. But they were elected democratically, of course. But I mean, the idea was, some people said, if they had stayed as a strong opposition movement, it would have been much better for them as a group as well as better for the whole country as well. That's just the counter side or the flip okay. side of the argument. I have a minute left. I want to go to Najib about this. You were talking about outside interference. We know about outside interference as far as Western countries are concerned, the United yes. States particularly yes. being involved in Egypt, for one. What about interference by other countries in the Middle East, Qatar? For one, mm -hmm. the United Arab Emirates. Definitely, yes. Oh, well, uh, in the case of Tunisia, again, uh, Qatar is known. It's a known fact that Qatar is supporting the Islamist Brotherhood in Tunisia, the Nada Party, which, by the way, has made many concessions for the reasons I gave, but also, and I would like to corroborate what our colleagues were saying, my colleagues were saying, is that, yeah, there is a strong civil society in Tunisia that opposes the Islamist agenda. One has to say it, particularly women's group. They're very mobilized in Tunisia, and to the point that the Islamists had to make concessions about regarding women's rights, which are quite, um, uh, Tunisian women, as we know, enjoy practically equal rights uh, before the arrival of the Islamists on the political scene. Uh, so Qatar has, been, has an agenda. Saudi Arabia has another one. Uh, both of them, uh, the United States has one, but both all these nations, these countries, do try uh, through their means, mostly financial means, to interfere. Uh, NADA has uh, just uh, hired a major uh, PR firm in Washington, D.C., and paid uh, something like $12 million in Washington for, to, to improve its image in the West, particularly in the United States, in provision of the elections. And the money is known that it comes from Qatar. Uh, I believe it would have been better to invest it in creating jobs. Right. Because okay. I would like to mention that. Yeah. The economy will bring these two sides together. The economy, they're doing very okay. poorly econom on the economic front in Egypt and in Tunisia. And, and if another Arab Spring will, or the Arab Spring will be, another revolution will occur, it will be for e purely economic reasons, or mostly for economic reasons. If they don't deal, if they don't create jobs, if they don't reduce the inflation, right. And, 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 and bring about economic growth, we are heading towards another, another uprising. Okay, we are going to have to leave it there. I'm afraid <laughs> we've run out of time. Saha Khamis, Najib Bayachi, Hamid Abdel Jabbar from New York, thanks to all of you for being with us. And that's all the time we have for in this discussion, but the conversation continues online. To comment on this or any other show, you can reach the Heat team by emailing the Heat at cctv-america.com or you can chat with us on Twitter at cctv underscore America. I'm Arnold Nido in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.